would not understand it and would want to insert as many commercial aspects as possible. I understand that impulse, even though it is so detrimental, but I can understand why a studio would do that. That is why you don't make this movie as a big budget studio action movie. You make it small. You make it about the characters. You get a quirky director that understands this stuff and has done it before. Correct. Michelle Gondry, not the guy from Blade. You know, you do weirdness on a small scale. You don't make it a spectacle. And even though I love the spectacle of this, it's the only thing to love about this. It is at the cost of your brain cell. And you, you mentioned, like, Terry Gilliam, like... The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, like, that's got better effects than this does. And I'm sure the, that budget was much smaller than this one year. Like, I just feel like if you get a director that gets this kind of sensibility, they could do more with, even though the budget might not be there. Yeah, this should never have been a big blockbuster. It was conceived inappropriately. Yeah, and I think a case of too many cooks. And so what we've got here is something that just the longer it goes the Mm. worse it gets. Yeah, it becomes incomprehensible here in the second half. Yeah, M now revealing himself to be Moriarty after the Venice fight. I didn't get that reveal because we'd only seen M once. Yeah, that's the biggest problem of this entire movie to me is when they unmask him and Connery goes, you, and I'm like, who? If he had been like, hey, it's steampunk, can they give us a video phone so that he could like show up and go, how's it going a few times? Then I might have clicked who the hell this guy was, but that he's this strange M from the beginning. And then we see him with latex over part of his face and Connery's reaction. I'm like, I care why? And we hated this guy in Mission Impossible, too, as well. I also think it's some of the, it's just the actor is unappealing, both as the Phantom and as Moriarty. I just Was think, he the actor I really liked who played the bad guy in part two? He was the guy that played, you liked that? Artie loved it. That 20 minutes walking down a dock, you enjoyed that? <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the tape, I recommended it. Yeah, he really liked that one, Stuart. Yeah, I did. Ugh. Well, anyway, I feel like the problem is that the villain in general, performance, writing, costuming, everything about Phantom is dismal. And then they leave a phonograph for them to listen to, and the phonograph has a tone that will set off a bomb when a timer just won't do. But of course, we don't want to sit there watching a record, so interspersed with that is old-timey movie footage that doesn't exist of the villain explaining to the camera what he's done. It's bad. It was so weird. I swore you see Mina like dropping the needle as this record's being cut. I guess it was just some other female that was helping him. But I'm like, wait, was that her? Like, it's so confusing because this style of cutting to an old timey black and white film has not been used thus far in this film. And all of a sudden, here it is. That didn't actually bother me. You know, I took it as a stylistic choice to show this is what happened in the past when they were recording this photograph. I caught that the film like stuttered. But I went with it as a way of showing us this is not actually happening live. You were seeing something that happened before if they had videoed it. I I meant what I said. We don't want to sit here watching a record play. I mean, but yeah, they needed something visual to do. But yeah, again, all of this is sending a a, transmitting a signal that's going to blow up the sub. But Hyde will save the day. No, he's the only one that could hear it. Well, yeah, I guess later on, once the bomb goes off, because... He could hear that high signal. He's saying, turn it off, turn it off, but it blows. And then he finally hulks out because he could pull some lever that does something and drains some water. Right. What would he know about this ship? I mean, again, I shouldn't ask these questions. Well, Jekyll is a doctor. We should take him as general smart guy. And Because Jekyll is a doctor, he knows how to stop, plug a hole in a sinking sub. How many times have we seen Dr. Know-it-alls in these kinds of movies? I'm a proctologist and a dentist. Well, they're all doctors. Mina is a doctor. Mina was the one that picked up the powder and said, oh, this came from a camera. Yeah, she's got test tubes she's doing (laughs) stuff with that never pays off. You know, again, poorly defined characters, poorly defined powers. Uh, I mean, talk about poorly defined powers. There is a hole in the sub and it's going to submerge later on in the film. I guess if I was a doctor, I could understand how that works. I don't want to understand anymore. I'm I mean, I can I can throw some things at here like 
there's often thick doors you can close to stop the yeah. water from infiltrating the whole ship. Stop and- the leak further, but they're using that ship for the... They go to Mongolia in this thing. <laughs> Yeah. And again, with steampunk, it defies science as we know it. And it takes, you know, an old fashioned idea. I can forgive it only so much. And this movie has broken that promise. And there's 40 minutes to go. Like so much steampunk. I mean, that Will Smith movie. I enjoyed that much longer than most people. And then the spider showed up. when you get a steampunk (laughs) spider. Yes, exactly. It finally breaks. They finally go so stupid that you just go, ah, damn it. Another one that just is not going to work. And that's another film that also suffered from heavy studio interference. But yeah, here, the worst part to me is when I realized we have 40 minutes to go after the submarine thing. We've got all this stuff going on to Mongolia where the Invisible Man is going to walk through snow naked. No boots. No, no, you forgot the mo- the big symbolic moment, the big character moment for Quarterman. <laughs> to, to say I didn't give a shit about it is different than rem- forgetting it. <laughs> Come on, he sees the Siberian tiger. Everyone wanted to forget it when the white tiger mauled Siegfried and Roy a few months after this movie came out. <laughs> Even that scene it lost some of its charm. It's like, maybe we don't like these white tigers. Okay. But yes, this is a star vehicle mostly for Connery. They're trying to placate his ego. He's the tiger that may be put out to pasture. He's got this sun figure with Tom Sawyer. He's trying to train to shoot and trying to protect him so that it doesn't die like his son. They're trying to give him things to do. And I do think that, yeah, if you're going to give somebody something to do in this movie, he's the one to give it to. But it's not helping this movie. Yeah, but the Invisible Man shows up naked in the snow. Funny story. Okay, I want to hear this now. (laughs) (laughs) This whole movie, everyone thought Skinner was the traitor. And here he comes back and he's accepted by the group because they know he wasn't. Well, he's walking in the snow Sean Connery was supposed to put his arm around the Invisible Man, like that a boy. And Sean Connery's like, but he's naked. Yeah. (laughs) I already see where this is going. So his tally whacker's out. Uh, Yeah, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) But he's not really there, Sean. Come on. What I I was wondering, because they go into the cave, and now the Invisible Man does have his white makeup on. Where is he hiding that white makeup? That is what I want to know at this point. That, that is where my mind has gone because this film is not keeping me entertained. If he shoves something up his ass, is it still invisible? We see him drink something and we yeah, see it I going think it down. Yeah, I think it wouldn't be. We see, <laughs> yes, exactly. When he ingests things in his internal organs, we can see that moving around. So there is no hiding that cream. But only for a short while. It then finally disappears as it gets absorbed, I guess. I don't know. Maybe they brought it with them. Maybe it's Mina's makeup that makes her (laughs) show up in mirrors. Maybe, like everything else in this movie, it doesn't Doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. No, what matters, I guess, is that there's this big factory that's making not a lie. And are are those robot men or are those just like armor suits for people to fight in? I don't know, but it's so gorgeous. Don't you wish this movie earned this climax? (laughs) Oh, no, I totally wish. Like in the comic, they do this whole thing with Fu Manchu and they have like this big Chinese army with like kites that come like i wanted something glorious like that we are not we're gonna see one little robot walking around shooting flames in this final scene yeah they said they couldn't do fu manchu because he's not public domain Hmm. nick cage wanted to play him (laughs) that would have been great but i thought those were guys in armored suits we talked about armored plating earlier in the movie it's just it's steampunk they should be robots well they are and they no i get the sense that they are playing up to the iconography of world war 1 and world war 2 that this is the coming centuries war machines that the, that is coming early that this is the dawn of that monstrosity I, I like that as a concept but let's talk about the execution yeah and then there's these battles which is just a flurry of noise but then again i felt this way about blade are you not going to give norrington any blame i'm not i'm not i think blade the blade had a bad ending but i thought it did very well with what it had and the actors and the story the whole reshot ending of la madra horrible Mm. but the rest of that film i so much enjoy and here yeah Obviously, he's somewhat to blame because he didn't have the balls to say, do it my way or I quit. He should have been Alan Smithy or he should have walked or he should have had some balls. But here, his biggest fault is continuing. 
Yeah, he wanted to get paid. I can't blame him for that. But yeah, it's, and the fact that he hasn't made a film again is telling. I mean, Sean, from what I understand, medically can't make more films. Yeah, he did do some voice work in a really bad animated film. But as I understand it, he had just such a bad experience filming this and the long days and the effects work and the trouble with Norrington. And Norrington didn't like him very much either. And he was having knee problems. He just decided he didn't like filmmaking anymore. I've heard rumors of bad health currently, but those rumors weren't going around in 2003. In 2003, he decided to retire after this. And this movie was why, he, it, per him in interviews. Yeah. I mean, it's not his worst movie by a long stretch, but I could understand why you would throw in a towel from an experience this bad. This is obviously not going to be your Matrix or your Lord of the Rings. And I think Norrington could have gotten more director gigs if that's what he wanted to do. But Oh, yeah. No, I agree with that. You can re you can do something smaller. You know, they'd, they'd hire him for something. He walked away in disgust. Yeah, he's still doing effects work and makeup work in certain films, but... I think this was him saying, I don't want to do this anymore. And I, I'm sure people weren't banging down his door mm -mm. after this. Mm -mm. I'm not going to ask him after Blade <laughs> in this. No, that's fine. I'd ask him after Blade. But yeah, this whole fight at the end, when they all put their hands on top of each other, that is an unearned <laughs> moment. <laughs> I, I just find it funny that Moriarty, like he runs away, like everything's getting blown up. And he's got this little satchel with like his Mr. Hyde formula and Invisible Man formula. It's like these little cases that he's going to go door to door selling. Like plans <laughs> folded up for, to make your own not a lie in there. Like it is ridiculous. You know what disappointed me is I wanted the Super Scroll of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I wanted an invisible vampire Hyde. <laughs> yeah, that seems like what you would do. Like, yeah, the Super Soldier. But instead, we, it's all. Is there another vampire that fights? I know there's like another invisible man. We'll get a super hide, which, okay, no money for the effects there, right? It was said that there were some vampiric soldiers, but I don't know that we saw them in action. Yeah, they didn't make an impression on me. Also, I definitely think they stole effects directly from Attack of the Clones. ILM worked on this. They show the machines in action. This is right off of that Geonosian assembly mm -hmm. line with the lava that pours on Amidala. Yeah, I can see some of that. Oh, that's right. That is right. It, that's what it was reminding me of. Oh, it's it identical. Of yeah. It is. I couldn't find any proof that that's the same assets, but come on. Yeah, I can see that for sure. I definitely think they wuss out here. And now that you're saying the, the fear about the R rating, there's a whole thing between Hyde and Super Hyde where they're fighting underneath icicles. I'm like, well, of course they're going to fall and pierce him. And then that like they don't do that. It just like some rocks. No, but they just dodge icicles for like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, like there's no blood. There's it's bloodless. Even though you got a vampire here, she might wipe off a little red off her face. But there's no thrill to these fights. Even if you could forgive this movie its plot, there's nothing to this action. It's a bunch of flips and explosions. And this whole fight between two immortals is very quick. They slice each other and they bleed black, or they have black wounds because red is R. But then. It's very quick for her to impale him against the wall and say, oh, look, a picture of you. You're dead. <laughs> well, admittedly, that is the story that they've framed yeah. this around. But yes, how unsatisfying to be shown uh, painting. Was the whole reason Dorian betrayed him because he wanted to get that picture back? Yes. Yes. Or he already stole it and that this is how he would get it? Yes. Yes. Now, did you guys get, because I sure as hell didn't, in two watchings of the climax, the other invisible man was actually a character in this movie. It wasn't just somebody who showed up at the end. It was Sanderson who went and recruited Quartermain in that first scene. What? No, I, I, I'll i be honest. Like, this all just washed over me. It, it's dark. The effects aren't that great. It's loud. No, I didn't know this was someone we were supposed to care about. That was the guy that picked up Connery at the beginning. Why did he betray him? He was working for M the whole time. Oh, so he was recruiting him to kill him? He was recruiting him to get Hyde so that M could steal all the powers, but he was M's lackey, and so here he became invisible. I okay, I missed something crucial when I understood that Quartermain was the only person that could catch Hyde. All right, that was his whole function. So they could have killed him at any time after Paris. Yeah, and if they had, they probably would have won. Okay. And in fact, they tried to with that whole bomb thing. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> 
And they do kill him, at least temporarily. We're, we're led to believe that, yes, he goes down. Tom Sawyer has to get the kill shot. You know, he has to live up to Quartermain, apply the lessons to markmanship. Don't shoot 